Haribo, I'm Sita Pati, and I want to talk a little bit now about science, and kind of from an apologetic, um, in terms of uh, the formal meaning of apologetics, you know, explaining a faith tradition in terms of the people outside the tradition. I want to look at science a little bit. Science is basically a form of Sankhya. It's a form of analyzing the material world and dividing up the different elements there. And uh, science works, you know, uh, as evidenced by the fact that you're watching this right now, you know. It's by science that we have a thing like a, a digital video camera, um, you know, a, a memory card, uh, a computer, the internet, screens, LCDs. These are all products of science and technology, and that's sunk here of dividing the world up in that way. So yeah, science works as far as it goes. Uh, it's not, I don't think it's really valid to say that science doesn't work because it obviously does, clearly. Uh, but at the same time, science is limited in what it deals with. It's, it deals with the physical elements of the universe. And there's more at work in the universe than simply the physical elements because there's also consciousness, conscious experience, and life, which are things that m the material science can't deal with. It doesn't have any, you know, it really doesn't have anything to say about those things. It's outside its purview, and that's more of a metaphysical area. And that's where Krishna consciousness comes in. That's the strength of Krishna, the contribution of Krishna consciousness is in the area of consciousness, the area of meaning to things. Meaning means why. So Krishna consciousness and metaphysics can answer the question of why, whereas science addresses the question of how. So science can explain how the planets are, to a certain degree, how the planets are orbiting the Earth or the, or the Sun how the planets are orbiting the sun, and so based on that, how they can make predictions of things like solar eclipses and, um, you know, precession of the stars, and, and they can check those observations and see that they're valid and that they actually work. There's something for you to eat down there. And so in that way it works and it shows how, but it can't answer the question of why. Why do things happen like that? Another example is the difference between how the sky is blue and why the sky is blue. We can answer the question with science of how the sky is blue by talking about refraction of light and, you know, how the, the light rays hit the, um, the, different, the refractive index of the different mediums that they travel through and how that changes the light to blue, but it doesn't answer the question of why. So metaphysics answers the questions of why, which are very important questions for human beings because we're conscious living beings and significance and meaning are very central to our lives. So both of them are there, and they both have some validity. I think a, an, an analog between modern science and something that we find in the Vedic context is the Vedic Sankhya of Kapiladev. And there are actually two Vedic Sankhyas of Kapiladev. There's the one which is called that of Kapila the Atheist, and then there's the other which is called that of Kapila Devahuti Putra, the son of Devahuti. And the difference between them is that the Sankhya, the atheistic Sankhya, has 25 elements in it, 25 material elements that it analyzes the world in. And by analyzing the world in terms of different elements, you can make predictions, you can make inferences, you can do things based on that. Um, so just like the atheistic Sankhya of Kapila, the atheist, we have modern science which analyzes the world in purely physical elements and you can make predictions, you can make technologies and things, you know, genetic engineering, electronics, all these things are based on this Sankhya, this analysis. And then there's the Sankhya of Kapila Dev, son of Devahuti, which has the same 25 elements and it also has the 26th element, the soul and sometimes it is said the 27th element, the super soul. So in the same way, I think we could find a, a harmony between science and the metaphysics of Krishna consciousness in terms of understanding science as a sankhya of the universe and that there is an atheistic science and there's a theistic science which also includes knowledge of the soul and the super soul. And that's where I think our great contribution to the modern civilization and society lies is in building that uh, harmonious system which takes that Sankhya and makes it theistic. And I've spoken on this, I've written articles about it, that sci atheistic science actually arises as a reaction against religious fundamentalism, where people try to use religion as a means of controlling society, and then science is utilized as a philosophy 
to break that control of uh, religion over society. So when religious institutions react by trying to make science out to be something evil or incorrect, then the natural response of people, you know, people who don't want to fall under that oppressive regime is that they make science more atheistic and they argue strongly against the metaphysic. Because the, the, the adherents of a metaphysical system are now trying to say that, you know, the Sankhya is invalid or it's evil or something like that. Whereas science is not evil, it's just a way of analyzing the universe and it does work, which is evidenced by the fact that, we're, that I'm speaking this and you're listening to it now. That's, that's evidence that science does work. Of course, there are, there are other things like medical science, for example. The problem with, with modern medicine is not so much science, but more that modern medicine is a mixture of economics and science. And it's that economic influence which mutates the, the scientific method. If you read that book, Forbidden Archaeology, by Michael Cremo and Richard Thompson, the actual accusation that they're making against archaeology is one that basically that it's not following the scientific, the formal scientific method. And in medical science, they don't follow the formal scientific method. They'll, they will discard observations that they should have included uh, on the basis of economic interest because the medical industry is not run by scientists, it's run by businesses. So when science comes under the employ of, of business, then it becomes perverted. And also, in the case of archaeology, the argument that Kremo, uh, Drutakama, and Sadaputa make is that uh, basically, there it's being influenced by people's egos being involved in it. But, you know, religious institutions also become um, distorted by people's egos. Just the other day I saw one magazine in the city, a socialist magazine, and it said capitalism is the cause of this disaster, talking about the recent global financial crisis. So we could say that in a sense, but then we have to ask the question, what's the cause of capitalism? So really... What it comes back to is it comes back to the personal character of the people who are operating the system, whether it's a religious system or a scientific system. The personal character of those people will influence how that system is utilized. So rather than throwing out the baby with the bathwater, either by saying we should chuck out religion because of oppressive ruling religious elites who want to control how people think and what they do, or throwing out science by saying scientists are all atheists, science is evil, we should throw it out. We need to understand how science and religion are both um, different points along a continuous spectrum. Where science is the sankhya of understanding the physical phenomena that we can observe with our senses, and then religious process and metaphysics is the understanding of those things which are beyond the realm of the senses but are still within our experience because we are conscious living beings and we have experience of being conscious. We have experience of the world, uh, which is something that we can't analyze with the senses. You know, in the Bhagavatam and in the Bhagavad Gita it says, higher than dull matter are the senses, higher than the senses is the mind, higher than the mind is the intelligence, higher than the intelligence is the soul, beyond the soul is the super soul. So senses can perceive dull matter, but dull matter cannot perceive the senses. The mind can perceive the senses, but the senses cannot perceive the mind. So once we get to that level, we've reached really the limits of science. Because science is based on pratyaksha, which is direct perception, and anuman, or logical inference. And then beyond that, to the level of the soul and the super soul, we need another process to take us to that level. And that's the level where meaning comes into life. So science divorced of religion uh, becomes meaningless. And then religion divorced of science can become fanatical. And um, that's really an unhealthy thing to, to divorce the two because they are two parts of a continuous spectrum. And as my friend Ryan said the other day, you know, if you reject science, then it means that it cannot be used in Krishna's service. But actually everything can be used in Krishna's service. And the fact of the matter is that we are using science all the time. Even just by listening to this right now, you, you are participating in the benefits of science. So it would be kind of ridiculous to turn around and say, well, science is bogus or it doesn't work or it's evil, because right now, you know, it's like that old palm olive ad, you're soaking in it. <laughs> science, it works. Krishna consciousness, it also works. Two great tastes that taste great together. Hare Krishna.